I'm going to get things started with asking you all a question. I know you're here to learn more about how to di deal with difficult people. And I want to put a poll out there. So those of who have joined us already, I want to put a poll out there. Let me run this scenario by you. Use the emoji button that's on your Zoom screen in order to respond to this poll. So by a show of hands, here's what I want you to think about. Have you ever had a conversation? It could have been with a peer, could have been with a boss, it could have been with a direct report, could have been with a family member, uh, it could have been with a friend, um, and you know you have an opposing opinion, that you've got some strong emotion around how you feel or think about this. There's, there's maybe some high stakes associated with this. There's a, there's a relationship that might get damaged, or you could get fired for saying what you're, you, you know you need to say. Or you could force a key employee to leave you or to quit because of something you feel like you need to say. And then all of a sudden you say, hmm, I better not have this conversation. You back away from having this difficult conversation because we fear that we're going to make it worse. So use that emoji button on your Zoom screen, if you would, and by a show of hands, I'd like to see how many have been in that situation themselves. There's been a couple, there's another one. I'm gonna raise my hand, I'm not gonna use the emoji. Fairly common, it's really popping up there. So yeah, we often run into that situation. And then here's another one, I wanna just run this one by you, uh, fear. Now, fear is an acronym sometimes used when it comes to dealing with difficult people. We fear them, not because of some bodily injury that they might in, 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 instill on us, it, that sometimes is it, but fear is an acronym for false expectations appearing real. And so we're perceiving what the outcome would be if we have this difficult conversation with someone. And again, it could be a boss, it could be a peer, it could be uh, someone who works for us. And understanding that 70%, studies have shown us 70% of all of us, well, we're geared to be conflict avoidant. We don't, as humans, for the most part, unless we're the very small minority who do not fear conflict, do not fear confrontation. Do not fear that we're going to say something that's going to offend somebody. That false expectation appearing real, we're just not built that way. You fear that, that saying something that needs to be said, having that tough conversation as potentially creating a disturbance or eroding that relationship. So another show of emoji hands. How many of you back off because you expect a, a reaction ahead of time. So hit those emoji buttons. Let's, let's take the poll here. Here we go. I see a few. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I appreciate that guys. I really do. So, um, you know, you have no idea how many, underperforming employees keep their jobs much longer than they should be keeping their jobs because of that. And today we're going to talk about how to address negative patterns of behavior. We're going to help you develop some strategies to transform the situation into, into something that you fear to something that is going to be beneficial and, and, and improve the situation and understanding that there's no one size fits all when it comes to difficult people. They take on all kinds of shapes, sizes, forms, and, and relationships. And we're gonna give you some great tips today, some, some uh, vital behaviors, some uh, best practices, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my own journey when it comes to dealing with difficult people. Uh, it, this is a subject that's near and dear to all of us here. 
at Results Driven Leadership. And we're really looking forward to be able to share some of these with you today. So let me introduce Results Driven Leadership. So I'm Vaughn Sigmund. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Results Driven Leadership. I'm a, I'm a former retail executive. I, uh, I retired back in 2012 from uh, being the regional vice president for CarMax out here on the West Coast. But I had 40 years of experience as a retail executive. And let me tell you, when you're in retail, you get to deal with a lot of difficult people. And speaking of difficult people, let me turn this over to Tony to introduce himself. Oh, thank you, Vaughn. I didn't realize comedy was in your repertoire. That's good. Yep. Every now and then, if I get up early enough. That's impressive. Uh, Tony Pan and I've been in the restaurant hospitality industry for a really long time. Um, and having been uh, the beneficiary of being able to, to start a lot of uh, big name chains, franchise groups, independent restaurants. Uh, I've worked with celebrity chefs. I've had a lot of exposure to uh, a lot of different types of people. Um, a lot of times that we would classify as difficult and was really in a situation for the majority of my career where I had to learn how to deal with those people. Otherwise, I wasn't going to be able to get where I wanted to be and I wasn't going to enjoy what I was doing. So um, hopefully today you'll be able to get some good nuggets of information from all us old people up here and Danny uh, to kind of give you some some ideas on on, on how to to deal uh, in, in this difficult world. Danny, what do you got to say for yourself? <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Danny Lands. Thank you guys. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining. My name is uh, Danny and I've uh, spent the majority of my career in aerospace and high tech manufacturing and service, professional service industry consulting. Um, at one point I had about 1,300 engineers I was responsible for in 46 countries. And I've had customers ranging from the biggest aerospace companies in the world to Major League Baseball and uh, working with many, many engineers all over the world. I would say I've probably had my fair share of lumps with difficult people as well. I always used to say that I was pretty much a mediocre engineer. And I think the reason that my career uh, escalated as quickly as it did and the success that I had largely was due to the fact of how I understood how to deal with people. Um, and so uh, I look forward to sharing some of that with y'all today. Thank you, Danny. And um, let's, let's get into dealing with difficult people. So most, most of us, the vast majority and the reason why you're joining us today, most likely is you need a way you need a, you need a step-by-step -step process, maybe even some confidence would be built from you knowing how to deal with difficult people. Because right now, the most common approach to dealing with difficult people is avoidance. And that's probably not the best approach. And like I, I said before we introduced ourselves, that's kept a lot of underperforming employees around because we avoid having that difficult conversation because we fear some, out, uh, some outcome to come from it. False expectations appearing real. We, we expect something or we fear something coming out of that conversation, some reaction, some outburst, some bad thing coming. It's our fight or flight nature that, that goes on within us, so we just avoid it. We, we don't fight, we flight. And we can, and there's three ways to deal with difficult people. We can, we can avoid them or we can deal with them and it kind of get handled poorly. Or what we're hoping today after uh, you spend some time with us on this topic is, is you can learn to face them and have the confidence to face difficult people in difficult situations and handle them well. So, uh, Again, it's probably what brought you here today, but understand that when we're dealing with difficult situations in a difficult moment, or even if it's something we've been able to plan for, we're fighting our nature. We're, we're, we're fighting our bodies, we're fighting our brains. So, you know, let me just give you the scenario. Someone says something to us, and we vehemently disagree with it, 
but it's a topic that you feel pretty important to yourself and the, and you feel the hairs on the back of your neck start standing up and all of a sudden our body's taking over our nature our dna is taking over so you that fear pops up on the back of your neck or that the, the, that tingling happens and your body is now forcing blood into the, those little glands on top of your kidneys, those adrenal glands, and it's pumping adrenaline into you. And so you're getting all pumped up on adrenaline, and this is all taken in microseconds, and you have almost no control over what your body's doing. It's, it's taking blood from your brain and shooting it down into your body, and you don't choose to do this. It just happens. You're under pressure. And and very often, difficult conversations with difficult people are spontaneous. They come out of nowhere. So you can't always prepare for them. And there's, there's no books, there's no trainers, there's no coaches to come rushing in to help you out with some nifty little hints to, uh, to, to get your way through all this. So you're all pumped up um, and you have a response. And that response at the moment is the, is the greatest thing you could come up with. And then a, uh, a few hours go by, maybe even a couple days go by, and you realize, man, I handled that poorly. There, I should have done this. I should have done this. I should have done that. I think we've all been there. But understand, part of the most difficult part of dealing with difficult people is that we've got our bodies to contend with. And if we know that going in, and we know what our triggers are, and we know what our triggers are like, how they, how they present themselves, and then we can shift our minds away from the situation based on that trigger. Oh, I just got triggered. I know from the tingle on the back of my head that my body's about to take over. I've got to redirect my course a conversation. I've got to change it from dialogue or from monologue, excuse me, from monologue to dialogue. And the best way to do that is to slow down. Great leaders make great decisions under these kind of pressures. And people who are not equipped or prepared to respond to these sort of things tend to make bad decisions. And those bad decisions and those, those experiences keep us from dealing with difficult people. And so the best way to be able to turn this around and start dealing with a difficult person is to be able to transform the, the conversation away from you responding with a statement by you responding with a question. Because what you're striving for is what's called in psychology the pool of shared meaning. Somebody may have said something to you, but you didn't know what they really meant. Somebody may have uh, inadvertently uh, slighted you in some way, but did they really mean to do that? But we take it as a slight, we take it as an insult, and our body responds, our minds respond. And so as long as you recognize that the first step is not to respond with a statement, but to respond with a question. What did you really mean by that? You have to calm down a little bit and understand, I need to break my train of thought. I need to get this adrenaline under control. And I've got to get my dialogue skills into place. And as I collect this pool of shared meaning, I'm going to be able to have a much better conversation that will lead to a much better outcome. Jumping to conclusions often create difficult conversations. We got to stay focused on what we really want out of these conversations. We, um, uh, we can't let our internal thoughts come naturally. We have to direct those thoughts. And if we can turn that conversation into a dialogue, collect as much information as you can before you address it, before you share your part, you're going to have a much better conversation. And the more of those types of conversations you have, the more confident you're going to be in dealing with difficult situations, difficult people, whether that those difficult people are a direct report, they're a boss or they're a peer. And I'm just going to tell you my, my own little journey around this. 
Um, there was one time when I walked into the room, there was one time in my life when I was an executive and I walked into the room and I guarantee you in my mind, I was the smartest person in that room. And I'd walk in there with a mission. There was something I wanted to get done. And I wanted these, these folks that worked with me to get it done my way. And so I had a lot of monologues with them. And, you know, very often I got things done. But I talked a lot about dialogue. I'd, I talked that their, their opinions counted, that I wanted to get their input. But if their input was contrary to what I thought, well, let me tell you, I would lash out at them. I would put them in their place. I'd let them know that I was the smartest person in that room. I was the most intelligent. My way was undoubtedly the best way to go address this. Until I realized I was doing things very poorly. That my leadership was being eroded every time I did that. And I learned how to do what we're going to teach you to do today. I learned how to do it well. Because what I realized, what my epiphany was, that I was the difficult person. I was the difficult person that all my direct reports had to deal with. And you know how they dealt with it often? Silence. They drew back into themselves. And sometimes they, they used passive aggression with it. Sometimes they, my intimidation would get them to, to go out and take action. But rarely were they bought in completely to what I wanted to, to accomplish. And once I realized how important dialogue was to dealing with situations, difficult situations, I learned to transform myself into a much more effective leader. And from that, instead of avoiding difficult conversations, I knew how to go have tough conversations based on the way we're going to show you today. Uh, whether it was my boss, whether it was a peer, or whether it was a direct report, whether it was a customer, whether it was a family member, whether it was a friend. Because let me tell you, all those times that I feared some horrible result to come out of a difficult conversation, I've had hundreds, if not thousands, of these difficult conversations with very difficult people. And that, that initial instinct that something bad's going to come of it never presented itself. Bad things never happened once I approached it in the way we're going to share with you today. And that very much is based on the foundation of asking questions and getting information, uh, building the pool of collective knowledge so that I know everybody else's thoughts, their opinions, and I truly listen to all that. And then based on that, I can, I can make the right next step because often without all that information, our next step is poorly judged. It's poorly executed, and it ends up getting us into a deeper bad situation rather than out of it. We end up sometimes having to apologize for how we dealt with a difficult person. You know, imagine that. I bet there's a few of you on this, on this webinar today that have dealt with a difficult person the wrong way and had to apologize to your difficult person for doing it so poorly. That'll keep you from doing it again. I promise you, your ego will keep you from doing that again because you don't want to get yourself in trouble. So today we're going to share some tools, some skills. Hopefully you'll walk out of here with some knowledge today on how to deal with difficult people. And like, and hopefully uh, this isn't uh, shooting above the, the demographics today. Dale Carnegie once said, when dealing with people, remember you're not dealing with creatures of logic but creatures of emotion, creatures bris bristling with prejudice and motivated by pride and vanity. Our egos are so important to us, and it's hard to put those egos on the side, regardless of the side of the conversation we're on. So today we're going we're gonna to help you work your way through gaining the confidence and the skills to be able to go deal with difficult people in a way that's going to be highly productive. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Danny Lands. And I'm going to turn it over to Tony Pound. Oh, <laughs> I read the script wrong. We didn't practice this. 
And I'm going to turn it over to my dog, Zeke. All right. <laughs> Let Zeke go. Um, so, everybody okay? We're going to take a breath. We're, a lot of times we, you know, we, have, we do webinars where there's a lot of uh, conversation back and forth, but there's a, f a few too many people on this call, so we're just going to do the talking, um, unfortunately or fortunately for you. But when we start talking about difficult people, uh, it's an extremely difficult conversation. Most people don't want to address it to Vaughn's point. Most people uh, tend to, to shy away from it. Um, a lot of time it depends on your type of personality. If you're the type of person that backs away from confrontation, uh, just as a general personality trait, then it's gonna, you're gonna be that person that, that finds it very difficult to deal with difficult situations and difficult people. Um, I come from a world in hospitality that's littered with difficult people, whether they're customers, employees, bosses, vendors, family, friends, and of course, like Vaughn mentioned, even myself uh, was very difficult at times. And, and um, if you don't learn how to deal with it and you continually sweep it under the rug, it does come back and rear its ugly head in so many different ways, um, all of which impede on what we're all about here at Results Driven Leadership, which is getting results. Um, and so you figure out how do I normally deal with a difficult person? Go on, talk about one way, we just forget about it and, and, and store it away and shove it deep down um, and wait for it to rear its ugly head somewhere else. Or we like get with other people and we talk, you know, smack with them about the difficult person, um, you know, instead of confronting it, obviously. And, and uh, but you got to, Anytime some a situation like that happens, you always have to ask yourself, um, is talking crap and being pissed off or being silent, does it solve the problem? Have you elevated that into a solution to a problem or have you, like I said, just swept it under the rug? Because it's not like you can quit, you know, every time you have to deal with a difficult person or a difficult situation. It's not like you can fire them every time they're difficult. Uh, you know, they have to, the overriding theme of this, of this workshop and of this webinar is to confront the situation. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, and, you know, the first thing I think we want to talk about is, is what are some of the, the destructive behaviors and what do they, they look like? Um, obviously, this isn't all of them. These just seem to be very common out there in the, in the workplace. How do you respond to these, uh, these different destructive behaviors? Also, one more thing. I did want to make clear that, that you know, the purpose of dealing with difficult people is not to, to disparage the fact that they're difficult. Because as we noted, everybody's difficult at some point. Um, and, and in addition to the fact that we never really know what other people are going through. We don't know what the world they're bringing in. Um, so we should, we should be sensitive to that. And we should be... Um, prepared to have those conversations as we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, but we do know that if it affects productivity, if it affects chemistry, and more importantly results, we got to do something. Um, so the first, you know, being passive aggressive, and I can tell you that, that uh, this is one that bothers me more than anyone, because the other ones, you know, are pretty overt. Um, passive aggressive is not, and passive aggressive it, it can uh, hide itself uh, in various types of behaviors. Um, and, and there isn't a worse office killer than passive aggressive people. And, and that's people that, that, that behave in one manner, generally in front of you, uh, the person they're dealing with, uh, and then they're walking away and having a different conversation or having different behaviors when they're away from you. Um, your best friend when you're there and they're stabbing you when you're gone. That's an example of passive aggressive behavior. Um, and again, it, the, the fact that people don't like confrontation is one reason how it gets to that point. Um, and in dealing with passive aggressive people, the most important thing to understand is why are they passive aggressive? Why do they feel the need to have to say one thing to you and something else to someone else? Um, and what we tend to do is we tend to uh, assume the responsibility is going to be on them. They're the difficult person. They're the passive aggressive one. I have to either ignore it or deal with it as opposed to 
trying to get to the root of why they are the way they are. Uh, and why is it that they're afraid just to tell me straight up uh, what needs to be said? Um, a lot of time, as I mentioned, it's about their personality. They're just afraid to do it. So that comes around to you being the person that creates that environment that people are comfortable talking to you. We do a whole training module. It's called creating an environment of trust where we, we spend a lot of time working with people and getting them to understand how do, how do I get a, 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 create a world where people are open and honest so that we can get to the root of the problems, so that we can solve those problems, that we can collaborate on, on specific issues and things that we're dealing with without fear of retribution or fear of, of having our ego you know, bruised or whatever the case may be. Vaughn spoke to it eloquently about fear. Uh, fear prevents us from getting so much accomplished in our world and in our lives and in our business. Um, and we have to learn to, 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 to stop feeling afraid and start getting to the root of what the issues are. And Tavon made a great point that I was going to make. And that is 99.99% of the time when you do that, you're not going to get the response you thought you were going to get. Um, there's always that point one crazy person that you have to have escorted out. But uh, the majority of time, you're gonna, it's going to be welcomed. Uh, as long as there is that level of respect and, to Vaughn's point, the questions that are being asked instead of putting people on the defensive. Um, so that's passive aggressive. Responding with anger, you know, Vaughn mentioned the, the emotion, uh, and emotion is, is critical, and, and he is correct that it is innate within our DNA to respond to the response. So if someone is emotional, we tend to get emotional as well. Um, I'm suggesting, we're suggesting the exact opposite, that not only are you presenting questions to try to get to the root of, of the anger, but you're completely calm. And, and everybody's different. Some people are just, if they get, someone comes at them, they just can't stop themselves. So you have to know what those triggers are at one's point, and you have to be able to stop yourself and figure out what you need to do to be able to have a calm response. A lot of times that's, hey, I'm going to have to have a conversation later in the day or the next day or in a couple hours or after I you know, go outside and scream or something, whatever the case may be. Your response to them has to be calm. It has to, and I know it's easier said than done, believe me. But it has to be to that point. And, and, you know, pride and ego and all that stuff gets in the way of so much progress in your life. Uh, I, I, a great example is I work for a C, CEO who his entire response was always through emotion. Um, part of that made him a good leader. Part of that uh, ended up being his demise. Um, and, but what I learned from that was... What, you know, most people's response to him was not to get angry back at him because he was a big imposing figure and he was a CEO. So uh, their response wasn't, hey, I'm going to come back at you. Their response was to, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir, and run away and be passive aggressive like I talked about. Um, but what I learned from that situation was instead of responding with emotion, I let the wave carry over. Uh, I came back and I came back with facts. Uh, I came back with specifics. I came back with relevant questions to ask um, because I wanted to be able to fight the important battles with that man um, without having to be afraid. Uh, and I learned from this that he responded well to that. He didn't like it when you came back at him uh, with facts and figures that, that were maybe contrary to what he was saying, but he respected it. And I got the results more times than not that I was looking for. One key part of that was I didn't fight every battle that I had with him. I picked and choose what I felt were the most important. So um, always respond with calm and respond with questions and respond with information and facts. Uh, and you'll have a better chance, I think, at getting the results you're looking for. Um, constant complainer. Uh, and so I would ask you, uh, why do people complain? Now, we're in a webinar, so you probably don't have to answer, but uh, one reason why people complain is because they're allowed to. Uh, and, you know, the, the, 
like a lot of these, as you're going to see, people will, will, will basically perform at a level that, that, they're, that the expectations are set to. Um, so there's, that's one issue that you have. But the other issue is, again, why are they complaining? Is there no communicative outlet for them? Do they not feel comfortable talking to you as in the passive aggressive indiv individual? Um, so we have a tendency to label people right off the bat. That guy is the constant complainer. Don't worry about him or her. She just complains about everything. Instead of trying to get to, again, to the root of why, what is they're complaining about? Why are they complaining? And you're going to find out some amazing things. One amazing thing you might find out is that they are constant complainers and that doesn't matter what you do, they're just going to complain. But more times than not, you're going to find out that there was something, uh, some underlying issue that they had and something that was really relevant that should have been brought to your attention. Uh, but you're not going to ever determine that if you either ignore it or dismiss it as being just somebody that, that just likes to complain. So again, trying to create that environment where people are comfortable talking to you um, will get you, uh, will, will eliminate a lot of those complainers. Let's put it that way. Um, responding poorly to the stress. Now, this is one you have to be very careful with. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, you don't know where people's stress come from. You know, if you naturally just assume that people are stressed because they can't handle the responsibilities of the job, I would argue that that's probably not the case. People are generally stressed due to a lot of circumstances that are in their lives, many of which have nothing to do with what's going on in the workplace. So, you know, again, if you're in that situation and i can speak to this from experience and dealing in a lot of different environments with a lot of different types of people. Uh, I wanted to know what was going on in their lives. I wanted to ask them questions about their family. I wanted to know, and obviously not waiting till there was a problem, but prior to that, I wanted to get to know them um, because I wanted them to feel comfortable that to, to be able to come to me when there was situations that came up. Um, and you want people to come to you if you're in a leadership position or if you're dealing with a difficult or stressed out boss, you want to be able to, to, to understand where they come from. It helps dealing with them uh, a lot more effective. Um, so there, a lot of these people, you know, have a lot going on in their lives. And, and you know, I had a, a, a situation where um, I had a woman that just was uh, very stressed at work. And I never really felt that it had anything to do with work. So we spent a lot of time talking about it. And it turns out she was a single mom with a special needs child. And, you know, being able to, to get to work at a certain time was creating so much stress trying to get her kid ready for the caretaker. And there was just a, a, a myriad of circumstances that she was dealing with. Uh, what ended up coming from that was, was the conversation about coming in at a different time. Um, and whether that was ended up being an hour or two later, uh, I can't remember the exact specifics, but I do remember that we changed her in time and her stress went away. And I realized at that point it had nothing to do with what was going on at work, which the, the entire time I thought she was stressed out was because of work. Um, and I thought she couldn't handle her job responsibilities. So I was trying to figure out whether I had to, to, to terminate her, put her on another seat on a bus. I didn't know what to do. But I did find out that, I, that, that by taking the time to learn more about her, we solved the problem instantly. When she was able to come in later, it made her life completely different. So, something else. Um, playing the blame game, uh, that's a tough one uh, to fix sometimes because people not taking responsibility and, and blaming other people it sometimes is inherent in their DNA. Um, they're just that type of person. And it's not easy uh, to change someone who's like that naturally. Um, but I think the, the instead of automatically labeling them and putting them in a box of, hey, they just like to blame everybody, just like they like to complain about everybody, it's trying to, to learn more about uh, you know, what it is that drives them and what it is that makes them uh, feel the need to, to not take that responsibility. And there's so many different factors. I mean, we can sit here and talk an entire day about, you know, why people blame other people and why people don't take responsibility. Um, but a lot of times people don't take responsibility because they don't feel as though they're part of something. 
Uh, they don't feel as though anybody cares. They don't feel as though anybody's listening to them. So anytime something happens, they don't want ownership. Um, as opposed to the other side of that, which is when people do feel engaged, they do feel like they're part of something, they are being communicated to, um, more times than not, they want that ownership. And they're comfortable with taking responsibility when things don't go out, uh, don't come out right. Because they know who they're dealing with, they can trust. And they realize that that person is not going to uh, disparage them or, or treat them differently, that they're gonna, in turn, try to help them. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you this because I, I've been in that world and I know anybody that's been in any type of position of leadership has had to deal with people that, that don't take responsibility. And there's a, a lot of different reasons for it, but you got to get to the root of it and find out yourself and not just assume it's one thing or another. Um, and then late for everything, I would ask the same question that I asked about the complainer, which is why do you think people are late? And because they're allowed to be late. Uh, um, and, and, and your ability to hold people accountable and to set expectations and to communicate effectively uh, has everything to do with how people behave. You are gonna have that smaller percentage of people that you don't have to motivate, you don't have to worry about. They just, they're just in their DNA to just kick ass every day, show up on time, take responsibility, be calm, you know, be open and honest, you know, and those are the people that you better take good care of. Uh, you better do everything you can to make sure you retain them. Uh, but that's not where the majority sits. The majority sits in uh, be behaving how, uh, whatever the expect expectations allow them to, or how the expectations allow them to behave. Um, and so if you're allowing people to be late, then they're gonna be late. If it's very clear, again, there doesn't have to be emotion. It just has to be accountability and consequence. Um, but the other piece to that is, again, you gotta understand what the root cause of that behavior is. Why are they late? Um, and you're gonna find, you're gonna learn a lot of great things. You know, there's, again, stuff might be going on that you can fix, or just the fact that you listen to people, get them a little bit more inspired, uh, so that when you do hold them accountable, you know, they don't, they understand it. Um, but uh, a lot of this has all the same theme and all the same meaning behind it, which is, you got to get to know your people. You got to have open channels of communication. You have to collaborate with people. You have to get people engaged and want to talk. Uh, otherwise, a lot of these behave behaviors are going to just linger um, because that's a lot of these are innate behaviors that happen automatically due to their to, to just who they are as a human being. And so and a lot of it comes from a belief system that this is how based on their experience how they've had to act in the past. And you can never, you can rarely change someone's belief system without changing the experience. So if you change the experience, the, they'll start to believe differently. And that's where I'm gonna leave it. And now I'm gonna turn it over to somebody's name that I know, it's Danny. Thanks, Danny. Um, no problem, man. Yeah, so, and, and I would just like to add a really quick um, piggyback off of Tony's point there about the few people that you have working for you that are superstars that you don't need to manage that closely and how important it is to keep those people and keep them inspired. One of the best ways to not keep them and one of the best ways to get them looking for a new job is if you aren't dealing with the difficult people. Um, because the superstars don't want to see the difficult people getting away with murder. Um, and they're the ones that are having to pick up all the pieces and do the extra work to make up for it. So um, I would just, you know, be mindful that one of the best ways to retain the superstars is to deal with the difficult folks. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what we have here is just really a decision point. Uh, when you start to realize that you have a person that's if you have a onesie twosie type of difficult situation, you're able to deal with them uh, promptly, which is what we're gonna talk about on the next slide, then that's a different situation from a chronic difficult situation. And with a chronic difficult situation, you really have to consider the amount of time you're investing in managing that, that situation. 
and is that a good use of your time? And so what you have to look at then is, is this person a really great performer in some way, shape or form or not? And what I would argue then is that if the person is a terrific performer in some way, shape or form, uh, Tony brings up a great example. I had several like this where someone is a total nightmare internally, but they just, the customers love them. Um, so they have tremendous value to the organization in terms of how the customers perceive the organization, but everybody internally hates them. That may be a situation where uh, if they're, you know, really producing on the sales side or something like that, that you want to invest in trying to correct the internal behavior. Um, so the point here is that for the people you decide they are worth dealing with, you still have to deal with them and you still have to let them know that the behavior is unacceptable. However, together you're going to work to address it. And that's where he really comes back to what Vaughn and Tony mentioned about trying to understand what the root cause of the issues really are um, and making it a collaborative process to deal with it and making it very clear that the, the behavior is not acceptable, but there's going to be a team effort to work through what the issues are that are, that are causing that unacceptable behavior. And then conversely, if the person is not really performing that well and they're a pain in your butt, then do yourself a favor and everybody else in the organization and work on an exit strategy. Um, you know, one of the things that we see prolifically in smaller organizations is there's not a lot of redundancy. And so what, what we find is that companies really struggle with letting certain people go because they're the only person who knows how to do something. So don't let yourself fall into that trap. Cross-train people, um, you know, have people that are available to, to, uh, to work together and periodically understand each other's roles so that you don't feel uh, boxed in that way. And for the people that are not performing well and they are difficult to deal with, uh, you really have to very carefully consider how much time you're willing to invest in trying to correct that situation. And if the answer is you don't have much time available, then you're probably better off. And it's not to say that that person isn't going to be an outstanding employee somewhere, but for whatever reason, they're probably not going to be an outstanding employee for you. So just be conscientious of how much time you have to invest to try and reconcile and, and, and reverse course on that situation. Now, for those who we are going to invest in, for the ones that are performing at a high level and we want to deal with them and we want to correct the situation, the first thing that I would encourage you to do is to resist the urge to procrastinate. And so as Vaughn very eloquently pointed out initially and Tony mentioned as a follow-up to that, our nature is to hope that these things will get better. And I can categorically tell you in every single situation I ever dealt with in my management career, the situations that I hoped would go away only got worse. So the one way to guarantee almost that you cannot have a situation correct itself is to expect it to correct itself. Um, you have to be involved and you have to deal with the situation and you cannot procrastinate. A lot of the personality types or behavior types that Tony mentioned, um, those people are extremely good at deflecting, right? So it's not their fault or it was because of somebody else or whatever the case may be. So if you're not direct, immediate, and specific in your feedback with those people and, and explaining which behaviors are acceptable or which behaviors are unacceptable, if you allow two or three days to go by after a meeting where someone acted unprofessionally or, or, or unacceptably, by the time you address the situation two or three days later, they've already come up with a myriad of excuses for why that was okay or why it was somebody else's fault. If you deal with situations in a timely manner and you're very specific about what aspects of the behavior were unacceptable, it's a lot harder for the person to not be able to understand what it is that you're trying to correct or what it is that's unacceptable. To Vaughn and Tony's point, it's really important to understand why, and that's where the listening comes into play. So it's important to dictate what behaviors are unacceptable 
but then listen and be open to constructive feedback when the person explains why that, that particular behavior is happening. Uh, because while their reaction may be unacceptable, the underlying cause might also be unacceptable and you might be the, the culprit of that cause or somebody else may be the culprit of the cause and there may be something else that you have to deal with in order to correct the, the root cause of the problem. So a lot of times the bad behaviors or the difficult behaviors are really symptoms or, or reactions to what the real problem is. And so you have to be open enough and listen well enough to understand the cause of the problem. The next one is controlling your emotions. And this is, uh, I don't think there's a way to overstate how important this is. Um, and this is the one time that I encourage people to, uh, when you look at the direct, immediate, specific above that, this is the one time that I would recommend you do not deal with something immediately is if you cannot control your emotions. That's the one time I delay the conversation is if I'm just too hot under the collar to deal with the situation productively. Because once you have ele elevated emotions on both sides, it's very rarely a constructive conversation. Um, I'll, I'll just digress with a quick story. I had a fantastic plant manager that I worked for many years ago that was that had an extremely short fuse. He was a really great ops manager, but he really did have a short fuse. And one day he showed me uh, or showed incredible restraint in a meeting, which was very uncharacteristic of him. And so afterwards, when we had some time one on one, I said, hey, Kevin, you know, I just kind of jokingly said, you really seem to be restrained there when uh, that situation went sideways. And he said, well, Danny, he said, I learned a long time ago, and I'm sometimes not so great at using this technique, but I learned to count to 10 when something really upset me. So he said, something upsets me, and before I respond, I try to count to 10. And by then, I've kind of, you know, cooled off a little bit, and I can respond rationally. And the very next day, he just blew up on someone in a meeting. And right after that meeting, he called me into his office and he said, remember what I told you yesterday about counting to 10? And I said, yep. He said, yeah, I only got to two that time. <laughs> so, um, so controlling your emotions is a really, really critical part in having constructive dialogue with people. Um, if you are unable to control your emotions, you can't really expect the person that you're dealing with to control their emotions and the chances are the situation is gonna escalate rather than de-escalate. Uh, clearly explain the expectations here. So if the behavior is unacceptable, if the behavior is unprofessional, hopefully the behavior is not uh, discriminatory or anything else, but very, being very clear about what aspects of the behavior are unacceptable. Um, and one of the best ways to uh, ensure that that happens is to document the conversation. Um, and any, just about any lawyer I know that will tell you that uh, you don't have to have a formal form that you put it on, you don't have to have it notarized, you know, an email to yourself, a napkin scratch, whatever a case may be, document what was said, um, what you uh, articulated was unacceptable about the behavior, what the response was, what the agreement ultimately was, you know, just a few notes or bullet points is really, really uh, important. And a lot of us, and we see this all the time when we're training managers, a lot of us think we explain things incredibly clearly, and I hate to break it to you, but often we don't. So it's really, really important to ask for confirmation of understanding. And what that usually looks like is at literally asking the person to tell you what they understood from that conversation. And what you'll often find is what they regurgitate back to you is slightly different than what you thought you told them. And so then there's an opportunity to clarify once again. Um, so this is a very important final step in this process where you uh, are confirming that there's understanding of what behaviors are acceptable versus what behaviors are unacceptable. And with that, I will, do we have the exercises, Vaughn? Yeah, okay. We sure do. All right, so um, normally just as a, as a, um, as the way these modules roll out when we do these with company management teams is 
We have a little bit of lecture time, which is usually much more interactive than this, but as, as Tony mentioned, since we have a lot of people on this call, we're having to make it a lecture style. Usually this is very interactive. We would try and get people to speak up and describe some of the difficult people they're dealing with, and we would do some role play and, and, and sort out how we're gonna deal with that. And then at the end, and you've been provided these in advance, there are exercises to really reinforce some of the materials that we've learned today. So um, we're not gonna go through those exercises in detail today, but normally we would. And this would be an opportunity for you to document some of the situations that you're dealing with and think through the steps we've outlined for you and how you're going to deal with them and come up with a little bit of a plan of how you're gonna deal with that specific difficult person in your life or difficult people in your life. So we firmly believe that if you just listen to a lecture like this and then walk away, very little changes. If you take the extra 10 minutes when we're done today to look through these exercises and document some of the things that we've discussed in terms of how you're gonna go and deal with one of those difficult people in your life, you have a far higher likelihood of actually following through on it and getting the most out of the time you spent today listening to us lecture. So um, just highly encourage you to take a look at those and step through the process. And with that, I will turn it over to Bob. Thank you, team. I appreciate that. So today's workshop webinar was based on our training program called High Impact Manager Training. It's, it's comprised today, and it's growing, of 24 modules using a blended learning technique. We use all three of the, the learning approaches that create the most retention, primarily the kinesthetic portion of learning, learning by doing, of course. So uh, that's part of the exercise, that's part of the commitments we get at the end of each one of these courses that we conduct. And it is, it's vital for us to be able to get you moving with some of these, these techniques. I'm gonna ask real quick if everybody doesn't have their phone muted to do, or their, um, their computer muted to please uh, get them muted. Uh, we've got, we're getting some background noise there. So high impact manager. And some of the, the, the things we would do at the end of a class with you is we'd ask for a commitment. What have you learned today that you're gonna go put into action? And it, because you, you're going to learn best by putting something in action. So I'm going to, I, I'm going to take a, a modified approach to that with everybody, the 30 something people who are on here today and ask you if there's one thing or two things that you were a, a key takeaway for you, something that you, you believe will make a difference in your ability to deal with difficult people, whether they're a peer, a boss, a friend, a coworker, to write it down, put it in writing. Think about the situations that you've faced as an individual and dealing with this person, dealing with the situation or the person, and how you could change how you approach it in order to get a better outcome of the conversations. So that's the kinesthetic part. That's how if you can add that Start changing that as, as your habit, as your approach to dealing with difficult people. Slowly but surely, you're going to continue to get better. If you can get 1% better every day at dealing with difficult people, if you just keep trying and doing and learning and continuing, you're going to continue to get better and better and better at it. Write it down. Follow it up. Do not expect to be great at it the first time. Do not expect to be a master by the time you've, 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 you've had the fifth interaction. It takes time. It takes a lot of practice, but you've got to be committed to using what you learned in order to get better at it. So I ask you to write it down, commit to it, put some dates on it. Think about situations, people you either you're working with today or people you know today that you need to go back and have a different narrative with them based on what you learned today. And then go have it. Go have it. Understand that you, you, you've got to ask questions, you've got to get their side of things, you have to be open-minded about their perspective. And then in turn, you'll have a much more powerful and productive 
getting the results that you're looking for interaction with them. So I, I, I ask you all to go do that. Also part of the high impact manager training program, and there's just a few samples that we've got listed on the screen is acquiring and developing talent. Uh, we've got a whole set of modules around influencing others. We have six modules around self-development, working on yourself as a leader and as manager. And then we have another half dozen or so modules on how to improve your team's performance. These have been used with thousands of companies all across the country for many, many years. And we know they work. They work because they're real world. They're coming from former executives. People have actually done this firsthand. We're in the trenches, former executives. That's the information we share with you. We share with you the things that we've learned through our decades of experience. There's no theory in anything we share in our training classes. It's all firsthand knowledge based on our multi-decade experience of having done it as a successful manager and leader. So we've got a free offer to everybody that's attending today. Everybody that signed up and attended today, we're going to offer a free private workshop for you. It's a module of your choice. We'll, give you, we'll, we'll let you choose the one that you'd like to have. It's the full two-hour version of this. You'll get all the training. You'll get all the tools. You'll get the exercise. You'll get the discussion. You'll get the commitment as part of this free training. And then if that works for you and you want any additional training for either you or your organization, for your management team, We'll give you up to 11 more for only $249 a month. Now, we normally charge $420 a month. for it. We've, we've had hundreds of people pay the $420 a month for that. But as, as part of COVID, as part of our opportunity to gain new, new ideas and new perspectives and certainly new clients out there, we're offering this for the first time, $249 a head per month for future training, and you get to choose what those 11 modules are out of the 24. Now, if you'd like to mix yourself up with other managers in a class from other companies, and many companies like to do that, we'd be more than happy to allow you to join some other classes with other companies that are going through the same modules that you would like to be able to experience. So you can choose whether you want it privately or you want it mixed with other managers with other companies. And again, Remember, all of this is coming from executive trainers. We, we weren't trained to be trainers. We were trained to be leaders. And so instead of getting your training from somebody that only was trained on a program, they, they may have graduated from college and, get, and went to work for one of our competitors. And I, I can tell you, all of our competitors, and not, they seem to be doing fine with it. But I can tell you the relevance, the, the relativity of what we talk about is very different than somebody that just graduated from college and they were trained on a program, now they're out training managers. They're training a program. We're training what we've experienced in life. Because we've done it all wrong and we've done it all right. And we know how to tell the difference between the two. As I often say, we've made all the mistakes, so you don't have to. And so we'd love for you to be able to take the opportunity to seize this, this, this offer that we're, we're offering to you. You can gain the knowledge that you're looking for. We'll give you the tools, the skills. It'll help you reduce the people drama, certainly the workload and the frustration, the stress. If that's something that's, that's important to you, that's affecting your life as, as a leader, as a manager, it's certainly going to give you confidence that you know how to deal with situations in a, a more productive way in the future. And let me tell you, you start getting rid of turnover and frustration and stress you're gaining this confidence, you're going to reduce waste in your organization. You're going to lower turnover. Turnover is extremely expensive. And if, you're, if you follow the processes, the, the training, the leadership that we, we share with you and, and, and deliver in our classes, your turnover is going to get reduced. You're going, to, you're going to spend less time in unproductive meetings. You're going to get more stuff done. And by that, you'll be able to unlock your potential. You'll become much more adept at what you do day in and day out. You'll have the highest level of impact possible on your organization once you acquire these tools. And many 
unfortunately, managers out there, and there may be plenty of them on the, on the webinar today, they're training protocols were trial and error. I learned by doing, and I just figured out what I figured out. It may not be the right way, but it's the way I'm doing it. And that creates the epidemic that exists in America today in that 50% of everybody that leaves a job leaves because of a poor relationship with their manager, 50%. And the 70% of a recent poll by Gallup, 70% of the employees they polled, it was thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, reported back to Gallup that they would take another job tomorrow if a better opportunity came along because of the relationship that they have with their manager. And listen, you, you today, many of you, if you haven't been through a formal training session with experienced trainers like the three of us, you don't know what you don't know. And again, yeah, I've been through it. I've, I, I was a leader for 40 years in very high stress situations and Tony and Danny to some level of similar. Let us provide you with the skills, tools, and knowledge you need to go have the highest level of impact possible on your organization. You'll be able to start achieving things that you've only thought that you you could get to, that you've only dreamed of getting to. We'll show you the way. We'll show you the path. We'll show you the plan. We'll give you the techniques, the strategies, the tools, the skills, and we'll challenge you. We'll help you improve your skill sets to the level that you'll start delivering the achievements that you've always, either you or your team, dreamed of. The highest level of impact possible. We'll talk about tailoring a custom program just for you and your organization, either for just you, your entire team. We've got up to 54 different modules for you to choose from. And they, they, they go under high impact manager. We have a corporate alignment program that has been a game changer for many organizations we work with. Imagine getting all of your executives, all of your employees, all your mid-level managers, all on the same page, rowing in the same direction towards a common goal. There's a, there's a technique to that. There's a process to that. And our lineup program is able to deliver that for you. And then we have a results-driven sales manager. Managing salespeople is, is unique. It's, it's a special approach. You cannot manage salespeople like anybody else in the organization. And our results-driven sales management training program teaches sales managers who go through it the right way, the right way to get the most out of their sales team, holding them accountable, but at the same time walking that fine line of being able to continue to inspire them as well. And it's developing the right sales process. It's right the right compensation program, making sure you have the right KPIs, how you're planning those KPIs, having the right kinds of meetings, how long should those meetings, what day should those meetings be on, what's their sales training look like, how do you deal with underperforming salespeople, how do you get them to a higher level performance, or when's the right time to let them go. And then most importantly, how to hire top talent when it comes to salespeople. That's, that's another unique approach. And then we also offer executive coaching, one-on-one uh, -on -one up to two hours per month. Uh, and it is, it is a game changer. You know, why do you think a world-class boxer, tennis player, basketball player, um, uh, almost every Fortune 500 CEO has an executive coach? Why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't you be challenged and put on programs to continue to improve yourself. And that's what our executive coaching program does. So we will be reaching out to everybody on this call today with this offer. We'll put it in writing. We'll follow up with you and let you know we'll be reaching out to you. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about your situation, your needs, and we'll see if this works for you and your organization. And with that, I'd like to invite you all to our next workshop, which is coming up on August the 20th. And it's on one of our favorite topics, how to manage stress at work. After you've dealt with difficult people, right? So times have changed. 
drastically. And there's a very big change can be very stressful. And I know a lot of people are under stress levels that they've never faced before. And we'd love to be able to help you all identify what your stress points are and more importantly, how to deal with those productively so that you get them out of your life and you get that stress off your back. On behalf of Danny and Tony, the entire Results Driven Leadership Team, we thank you all. We had great turnout today. We appreciate it. We look forward to reaching out and speaking with as many of you as we can in the future. And if you have any questions in the meantime, reach out to us. We'd love to be able to talk to you. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at a future workshop.